Well, good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me at the back? Yeah, good, super, super, super. Good to see you all this morning. Um, if you are a visitor this morning, then please know how welcome you are. And I hope everyone around you makes you feel welcome. Uh, I'm Johnny, and I have to remind myself I am the pastor here. Um, good, good to see you all out. Um, just a couple of things just before I begin. First of all, our kids' program is on this morning down in the halls. So uh, if you're, I don't know what age is young anymore, um, but our young people can head down later to that. Um, adults, um, please stay. I know the sermon might put you asleep, but uh, don't, don't run down uh, with the kids. But just to say, if you have the opportunity at the end, and hopefully the guys won't, lock the, the hall up, please take an opportunity to go down to the hall um, because yesterday we had a big Patrick event um, uh, for our young people. Uh, we had drama happening here and we had crafts and things happening down the halls. But we did a competition uh, and the competition was the best, uh, best drawing of the snake. Um, and um, the, 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 the wonderful thing was that Ballyclare uh, Primary, uh, they got 175 children to do it. So we put all their pictures up plus more and give them all a prize for it. I had to do the prize, kind of had to uh, examine every one and make sure I knew which one was the best. So they're all still up is what I'm saying. Um, so if you want to go down and have a look at them, they are wonderful. They're so colourful and amazing, and thank you to all the kids. All those kids are getting uh, uh, eggs delivered to them this week uh, who, who uh, were in school. And some of the kids now are going, I didn't, I didn't complete one, I didn't complete one well. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I know Eve's going, oh, I didn't complete one. So, um, so please take the time to, to, to go down. Um, I'm going to hand over to our guys who are going to lead us in our worship. Um, but just before we do, let's just begin um, with prayer. Let's pray. And I want you, if you can actively this morning, to take just a moment and whether there's things you're going off to do in the rest of today, maybe just celebrating St. Patrick's Day, or um, there's things that are going on in your life that are, that are taking up time in your brain right now, maybe worry or whatever it might be, know that you're coming here today and you're coming before a God who loves you so, so deeply. And he wants to meet with you today, whether you're one year old or whether you're a hundred years old, he wants to meet with you afresh today. So take a moment and whatever those things are that are going on in your life, just place them before God, knowing that he does care. And then I'm going to pray. Father God, we delight uh, to come into your presence this day. And, and so, Holy Spirit, would you speak to each one of us today in so many different ways. Help us today to be refreshed, almost like as if we're going into a petrol station where we're going to be refilled. Lord, would you refill us today that we're equipped into the week ahead as a result of coming together. 
Lord, thank you as your people gather that we can come not only to worship you, but to encourage one another. And so, Lord, for those today who are feeling that they just really are in a tough place, may they today experience the encouragement and the love of their brothers and sisters around them. And Lord, that in everything we do in our singing, uh, in we, as we hear your word, may we lift and bring glory to you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Chris. Thank you, John. I had actually planned to do something similar to that, so you saved me, you saved me doing that. A quick, Sorry. Just to bring us into the attitude of worship, but thank you, John, it was perfect. Um, let's just stand and, and, and worship. favorite part of the service oh my word right and um, take a seat for just a moment we're going to sing for our kids well the kids aren't going out immediately because i'm going to play a game but we'll, we'll do that in a second um, so we're going to do the song jesus is the king uh, guys you want to bring the words up so as i can remember them jesus is the king ruler over everything so the 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 actions that go for this song are jesus is the king Ruler over everything. Jesus is the one, promised one, the Son of God. Is that right? Does anybody know the act? Is that fair enough? Okay. I'm making them up once again. Next one. Jesus is the Lord. He's the one you can't ignore. Jesus. 
Jesus, he is the king. Okay? And then we have verse in between. Everybody got that? Yeah? yeah. Who wants to help me at the front? Derek. <laughs> Fabulous. In certain churches, in, church, in one of my home church um, uh, back in Korean, we used to way, way back get our kids and got them to be leaders and got them to wear all the robes on the Sundays they were leading. Um, I'm not going to do that to you, Derek, but you are suddenly becoming the person that if I fell sick any day, you would take over the service. I feel that you could take over the service. Um, so are we going to do this? So it's Jesus is the king, ruler over everything. Jesus is the one, promised one, the son of God. Jesus is the Lord. He's the one you can't ignore, Jesus. Jesus is the king. Right. right. Super on your feet, please. Thank you. program and uh, I'm going to play a game because today is a special day. Today is what day? St. Patrick's Day. And whether you're from the north or whether from the south, everybody wants to celebrate St. Patrick. Now, the issue is who knows much about St. Patrick? That's the issue, okay? So as a bit of an incentive to help with that, we have some cream eggs, because cream eggs are all to do with St. Patrick. No, they're not. Uh, I can't bring pints of Guinness into church, so I'm bringing cream eggs in. Um, so there's the man on the screen. I'm not sure whether he looked like that or not. Um, but I'm going to ask you a series of questions, adults and everyone included. Um, so here's the story. If you get all the questions right, you get a cream egg. Now, if you nearly get them right, I'll be soft and I'll give as well, okay? So he, there are quite a few. I'll cut these down. And to help with it, everybody has actions. So we're going to do kind of YMC, YMCA kind of stuff. So if it's a myth, if you think what we're going to say about Patrick is a myth, then you do an M as in YMCA, okay? That means everyone does it. Thank you. And if it's truth, you do a T for truth. So truth or myth. Okay, ready? Okay, first one. It's great because I have all the answers. Uh, Patrick's real name, truth or myth, 
was Mayan Sukkot. Mayan Sukkot. Was that a myth or is that the truth? What do you think? There's a bit of a mixture. Okay, so it is true that was his birth name. And then later he became Patricius. And Patricius means father to the citizens. That's what Patricius means. So that's the first one. Anybody doing well so far? Oh, kind of. Okay, right. Next one. Patrick came from Wales. Myth or truth? Patrick came from Wales. Some people are going, not sure. Okay, the story is that that's a myth. We don't know where Patrick lived. Some say it was England, some say it was Wales, some say it was Scotland, some even say it was France. So it's not absolutely definite. How are we doing so far? Okay, right. Next one. Patrick looked after pigs on the Mourn Mountains. Patrick looked after pigs on the Mourn Mountains. Truth or myth? Truth or myth? It was, in fact, a myth. Okay. Patrick looked after sheep on Slemish. So he did. Um, right. Next one. God spoke to Patrick through visions and dreams. Truth or myth? Truth or myth? Yeah, you have all kind of got that. It is true. Patrick spent many hours praying and seeking after God, especially whenever he was a shepherd and he became a devout Christian. Next one. Okay. I'm looking at the really, really difficult ones. Okay. Patrick came back to Ireland to convert pagan Ireland to Christianity. True or myth? True or myth? It is indeed true. Mostly Druids, okay, uh, because they believed and worshipped other gods, okay. Two more to finish. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland. True or myth? True or myth? Everything. Okay, it's a myth. Scientists dispute the claim there were snakes in Ireland. And historians actually believe that the word back then for snake actually related to the word of druid. So whenever it was actually that he was driving snakes out, he was driving the druids out. Same kind of words. There you go. Bit of learning. Last question. Okay. Time to hand out some eggs. Patrick used the shamrock to teach about the trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. True or myth? True. Yeah, that's absolutely true. He used it as a little illustration, uh, an illustration um, for the Trinity, even though the Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible, but that's another story altogether. Now, um, who has been really, really honest and wants a cream egg? <laughs> Everybody's hand goes up. Okay, here you go. Right? Anybody got any allergies or anything like that I'm currently stating at this stage that I am not responsible if you go home and you have an allergic reaction, da 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 da, all that stuff. Who else? Did all you guys get all those answers? That is amazing. Do you know what I'm going to do to save time? I'm going to leave them at the back, and as you guys leave, Paul is going to police. Uh, Paul's good. And if, look, if there's not enough eggs, I've got even more because uh, I've got 175 to give to the school. So, uh, but please be honest, just don't grab an egg off Paul if you didn't get them, well, nearly right, okay? Let's pray for our young people as they leave, okay? Father God, we thank you for our young people and the joy of today. Lord, as we're thinking about Patrick, we pray, Lord, that as Patrick was not ashamed of the gospel, that our young people, as we pray over them now, they would not be ashamed of the gospel that they will declare in their schools, in their homes, with their families, with their friends, and that a new generation of Patricks will grow up from this town. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Folks, thank you for joining in in that uh, little bit of fun. Um, but it's good um, to know a little bit more about the purpose of St. Patrick. We're going to move, as we do each week, 
into a time of confession. And the words are going to appear on the screen um, for the confession. And I want you just to take a moment to think about areas of your life where you feel that you have fallen short of God's standards. We all have. All have sinned and fallen short. And just to reflect on those and know that you have a, have a loving and a forgiving Lord who doesn't condemn you, but wants you to know his love and his forgiveness in your life. So let's take a moment and then let's pray these words together. And so we pray, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on each one of us. Pardon and deliver us from all of our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And folks, I hope that by simply doing that and coming earnestly before God, you know that forgiveness, that that weight that has been on you is gone. That's in the past. Your sins are not remembered any longer. And therefore, we come into the rest of our time together with real joy, uh, without the burden. We're following the book of Romans and we're continuing today, which I know will be, as we start to read it, will be a very challenging passage of scripture today. Um, but I'm going to ask uh, Lorraine, who's going to come forward uh, and give us our reading from Romans, Romans chapter 9. And as she comes forward, I encourage you that if you can, um, open your Bibles, that's where they're there for, um, just to study God's word. Uh, Lorraine's going to read for us now. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 9, reading from verse 1 to 18, and in your Bibles it's on page 100, 1135. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscious con conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons, theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebecca's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet, before the twins were born or had done anything, good or bad, in order that God's promise, purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, 
I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, folks, we're, as we say, we're continuing in the letter to Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, and today, if you've just read or you've just listened to that reading and you're thinking to yourself, I just don't understand that, then don't worry because uh, for the past week or two, I've been in that very same position. Uh, and to help you and encourage you today, um, where theologians are concerned, they consider that Romans 9 is probably the most difficult or one of the most difficult uh, passages uh, in the whole of the Bible. Uh, In terms of theologically and doctrinally, we run into all kinds of debates, predestination, free will. We run into lots and lots of uh, stuff. Many ministers, when it comes to chapter 9, will say, that's fine, chapter 8 was lovely, Let's just skip a few chapters and everybody will be happy. In fact, this morning, as uh, Michael was scheduled to to preach, um, but Michael and Lorraine are just uh, challenged at the minute with uh, family things. uh, And he asked me uh, a week or so back, could uh, could we swap? And I said, no problem. By that stage, I hadn't read (laughs) Romans 9. I'm thinking, oh, who else can I get to, to, to speak on this? But I'm not going to skip it this morning. Um, I, might do, I might not do this real justice. Please forgive me if I don't. But I, I do know this. Scripture says these words. That the Word of God is alive and it's active. It penetrates... E, or sorry, it, it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. And then also we read that it's God-breathed, it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training, so that the servant of God, that's every one of us, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So whilst it's difficult and hard and challenging, um, it's for every one of us to build us up. So how dare I say, no, we'll just omit this chapter uh, because it's, it would make my life easier. Um, so just as we begin to dive into this, let's just pray. Um, and I'm going to ask you to pray silently. What I'm going to ask you to do is begin, if you wouldn't mind, just to pray for yourself and just simply ask that God would speak to you through his word. So let's take a moment just silently to pray that. And now, if you wouldn't mind, would you pray for me that I would be faithful to the Word of God? Amen. Thank you. You may not know this about me, but I love space. I love space. Uh, I love watching all the stuff that's online. Uh, As you know, I, I am fond of Elon Musk. Uh, I have a Tesla, and uh, what he's doing at the minute through SpaceX really uh, excites me. And this idea of being able to take a spacecraft uh, to Mars uh, and, uh, you know, a, a new colony beginning there, that, all that kind of stuff really excites me. Um, in fact, after Christchurch, someone came to me and said, do you want to come with me? I'm going to Canada in another month's time to see the solar eclipse. I thought... No, but, uh, but, but thank you. But I do, I do love all that kind of space stuff. Uh, but back in the 16th century, uh, there was a Polish astronomer called Copernicus, and he published something about space, about the planets back then. And it was all to do with the fact that he declared that the sun and all of the stars in the sky don't go round the earth. Everybody thought that everything kind of revolved around the earth, but in fact that the earth and all of the planets, they go round the sun. 
And it got me thinking about our passage this morning because it raises the question of do, do, we, do we think everything revolves around us? Does everything revolve around us? Because in chapter 9, Paul is saying that we all need to recognize something about God, the supreme being, that by nature, every one of us every day live all of our aspects of life where we think that we're the center of the the universe, uh, that everything revolves around us. And for some of us, it takes us to a place of thinking, well, God exists for me. Whenever I'm in trouble or I'm in any need, I'm going to get in touch with God and God comes and fixes my problems. And then the rest of the time, I just get on with my own little universe. But we need to understand God is God. He is or should be at the center. He put the stars in the sky. This morning as we woke up and recognized that breath, that breath comes from him. In fact, look whenever he writes in the book of Acts, he says this, for in him we live and we move and we have our being. Therefore, anything that we have in life that we receive is because of him. It's not that the universe revolves around us. Now, if everything else this morning seems challenging, that's because it is. And what's taught here in this chapter will cut against the grain of our hearts and our culture. Some people, whenever they preach in Romans 9, uh, people leave the church. They, people will walk out of church. Please, please don't do that to me this morning. But this is really important stuff, and please bear with me. It will seem quite heavy. So as we delve into the chapter, let's get our bearings. Let's kind of get a bit of perspective. Paul is writing to the Christians in Rome, And in the first eight chapters that we've already done, he's discussing the seriousness of turning away from God as if God didn't exist. And he then explains this rescue plan that God has had, that through Jesus' coming, through his death and his resurrection, it's going to bring hope to the world. And then Paul explains the Christian life that's going to flow from that. Two weeks ago, we ended with the giant of all chapters in the Bible, uh, chapter 8, with that assurance, as it says, that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. What an incredible promise that he brings to us. And so now we land in chapter 9, and suddenly there's this, just this change of topic, this change of tone, And suddenly Paul zooms in on the Jews, on the people of Israel, these people who God has chosen, who have all of these privileges. And the Israelites have had incredible privileges. They're the people that God entered into a covenant relationship with. They're the ones that God makes himself known to. They're the people that God dwells among. They're the people from whom comes Jesus the Messiah. So Israel was and is so privileged. But here's the problem. As Paul's writing this letter, most of the Jews are not followers of Jesus. Most of them don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And so how does Paul respond to that? It's in the opening verses. Verse 2, he says this, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. He's so hurt that his fellow people, his own people, are cut off from God. And in verse 1, he makes it absolutely clear how serious he is because he says, I speak the truth. I'm not lying. And then in verse 3, he says this. He actually says, "I I would rather perish. I would rather go to hell if it meant that my brothers and sisters, my Jewish brothers and sisters, would receive the blessing from God for eternal life. It's really cut him to the heart, folks. And that has got to challenge every one of us this morning. If today you're here and you wouldn't, down and honest, you wouldn't consider yourself to be a Christian, and that, by that I mean um, you fo- you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, then first of all, I am so glad that you're here today. 
but it's got to challenge you and make you consider what it is that you're missing out in life. Because where Paul's concerned, he says, you're missing out on everything. Your life is incomplete of purpose if you don't have that relationship with Jesus. Now, if this morning you are a Christian, a follower of Christ, then Paul should make us consider how we feel about those that we know who don't know Jesus. You know, I had a real example of this this week. I was at an event this week where I was with a a Jewish rabbi. And the Jewish rabbi wanted to pray over the people who were gathered. And he prayed the ironic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Those lovely words. And even more special, he prayed it in Hebrew. He sang it in Hebrew. And whilst that was incredibly special, it brought tears to my eyes and grieved me deeply because that man does not know the Lord Jesus as the Messiah. He doesn't recognize him. And so that should provoke us. What do we do about people who are not in a relationship with God? Now, as we move on, it would be very easy as we think about the Jews this morning. We think, oh, Johnny, that's all right, because I'm not a Jew. I don't think any of you are a Jew this morning, otherwise I've just offended you greatly. Um, I'm not a Jew, so... I'll switch off for the next 10, 15 minutes, waking me up whenever uh, you say the final prayer. Don't do that. And here's why. Because Paul's issue with the Jews is a far greater one. These chapters are about God and how he saves anybody. Yes, Jews, but also for all people. And also it raises massive issues about the integrity of God and who God is and, and, and I want us to explore that. Well, what, what I mean? Well, God says to his people, Israel, he says that they're his chosen people. He promises that he's going to save them. And, and so what has happened when we think about Paul? Has God broken his promise? Paul's fellow people have walked away from God. And so the question this morning is this, folks. Can God be trusted? And therefore, if it can be seen that God has broken his promise to the Jews, well, what does it do for you and me? Does it mean that we can really trust God? And that's where Paul starts. His first main point is this. God is faithful to his word. Look at verse 6. Paul says, It is not as though God's word had failed. You know, that's Paul's biggest concern. Is God actually trustworthy? And Paul answers, yes, the promises he made will be honored. But we've got to understand what God promised. Because, folks, I want to explain this, and hopefully simply, there is a true Israel, and there's a wider Israel. There's a true Israel, and there's a wider Israel. And God will keep his promises Verse 6, Paul says, For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. He's saying that not everyone who has an Israeli passport is a member of God's true Israel. Being part of God's family is not just about being able to trace yourself back to Father Abraham. It's got to be far more than that. Paul goes on and says, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. And here Paul provides a real example. Who was Abraham? Well, you'll remember Abraham. And he was desperate for a child. And he tries to quicken things up a little. And so he sleeps with his servant girl, Hagar, and she gives birth to a son called Ishmael. But Ishmael's descendants are not considered as God's people, even though their father was Abraham. God had decided that his blessings would come from Isaac. It came from a promise from God, rather than what Abraham wanted to do through his own fleshly desire. You see what I mean when it comes to being the center of the universe? 
It's not through man's intervention that this all happens. It is through God. It's God's call, not about our works. It's what Paul has stated. It's about God. Ultimately, it's down to what he decides. It's his initiative. Now, for those of you that are following your Bibles, and that's really why, that's really important why I believe that we should bring our Bibles in the church, you may have noticed something. Look at verse 13, verse 13. Because Paul's second example of how God chooses us and not us says this, and he refers to the prophet Malachi, which is the Old Testament, and it says these words, thanks for putting up on the screen, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. That word hated is quite tough. Is the prophet saying that God hated Esau, even though Esau didn't have any choice in the matter? You remember uh, Jacob and Esau and the, the tussle that there was, and yet Jacob was chosen and Esau wasn't, and God saying, I hated Esau. So how can that be? Esau didn't have any choice. Now, hopefully you might understand that, well, in my view, it doesn't literally mean that God hated Esau. You see, the prophet Malachi is actually referring to two nations. He's referring to Israel and he's referring to Edom. However, in fulfillment of the prophecy, God chooses Jacob, which is Israel, over Esau, which is Edom, as the one through whom blessings would come. Jacob becomes the father of the nation of Israel. And like Isaac, the second son of Abraham, who's chosen over Ishmael, Jacob or Israel was the child of the promise and the one through whom the Messiah would come. So folks, it's not that God hated Esau, even though Romans chapter 9 says God hated Esau, okay? The point is that God has chosen Jacob, God has chosen Isaac, God has chosen the Jews, God has chosen Christians who are the real children of Abraham. Now, whether we're familiar with all of that Old Testament stuff, the principle is this, God chooses who he saves. If I'm a Christian, then that's because God has decided not because of my background or because I've had Christian parents or because I've grown up in the church of all and all my life, Johnny, and therefore that makes me. No, not because I'm good or I'm worthy. It's got nothing to do with us. It's in spite of what is in us. It's simply because God has chosen us. He's chosen us to set his love on us. Now, the more you think about it, the more humbling that is, that it's not actually down to us. It's down to him. Now, Paul is going to come into the roles and responsibilities that that brings on to us. That's in chapter 10. If you're completely bored with chapter 9, then you'll be thinking, well, when chapter 10 comes, maybe I'll give that week a miss. Hopefully you won't. You have to wait for chapter 10. But as we sit in chapter 9, I realize that if you've, if you've thought this through enough, your head is probably already pickled by this, there might be really, really big questions in your mind right now. And Paul knows this. So the rest of the passage deals with one of the big issues, which is where I want to kind of finish. Verse 14 says this. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? In other words, God, are you being unfair? If it's all about you choosing who you save, then what part do I play? It might sound as if God can simply choose or reject people, dependent maybe on how he's feeling that day. But Paul says this. He says, not at all. God saves purely out of his mercy. If we're thinking that it's all about justice, the justice of God, then we're probably in the wrong space. We need to think about God's mercy today. And so Paul takes us into verse 15 to one final example in Scripture. You'll notice, or you'll maybe remember, that it referred to Moses and to the likes of Pharaoh. Why did he do that? Well, just think about what that's about. It's about the golden calf in Exodus 33 that we'll all know. So why does he choose that example? Well, it's because none of the people deserved God's mercy. 
Do you remember they rejected him? They're bowing down and worshiping a golden calf. And so the right thing for God to do is to completely destroy everyone. But what God says is this, I will have mercy on those whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. In other words, it's up to me, God, it's up to me what I do to these people. It's up to me whether I forgive these people or not. And as Paul says in verse 16, it doesn't depend on human will, but it depends on God's mercy. In other words, it doesn't depend on what we want or our little universe that revolves around us or what we do. We have no position to claim anything from God. Like back then, we are guilty, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We do not deserve anything at all from God. It's up to him to decide whether he shows mercy. And so it's incredible that God would choose to have mercy on anyone. And so Paul concludes in verse 18 by saying this, therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. And again, that might be really tough to hear. When God is faced with people who reject him and his will, he can choose to have mercy, but he can also choose to harden people. That doesn't mean he takes people who want to believe in him and he turns their heart against him, no. Rather, God looks at a rebellious people and he chooses to confirm some of them in their rebellion. It's not that he's being unfair, when faced with a world that wants to reject him, he can choose to have mercy and he can also choose to let their hearts be hardened, Paul says. So I realize now you've probably got a headache and thinking, that's heavy, heavy stuff. And so how I want to finish is I want to simply close by, well, how does all of this apply to little old me? Well, firstly, I believe it moves us towards deeper worship that God has chosen us that he has chosen to show mercy on us because we have no claim at all on him. I think, Chris, you're going to be leading a song next, which is called His Mercy Is More. Think about it this way. A criminal in a courtroom has no claim on a judge. A criminal can't go to a judge and say, sorry, um, I, 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 I matter here. The judge makes the decision. And similarly, we might think we can do the same with God, but no, we only can plead mercy on him or from him. And if today you have not given your life to the Lord, then can I urge you to cry out with mercy? And if you do, you will find that he is rich in mercy. But for many of us today who are Christians, then we should worship him for the mercy he shows. If this section does not lead us towards deeper worship, then we don't get this chapter. Our hearts are about responding right now in love to him, so worship. But the other implication it has is it brings us, uh, it brings us to unity, to unity. It should reflect how we respond to each other. Because it's like this, if we realize how merciful God has been to us, and we're mer we think about how God has been merciful to the person next to us, then that should bring us to a place of realizing that we should love one another because we're all in the same position. Do you know, do you know why unity generally doesn't come into people's lives? It's usually because they're so caught up in their little universe that they forget the mercy that God has shown them. So worship comes, unity comes, and then finally, as I finish, it has an implication for how we pray. The misunderstanding that some can have from this deep passage today is this, that if God is the center of everything, then I don't need to do anything. If God has already chosen people, then why, why do I need to even pray for them? I think it was... Um, I'm racking, racking my brain here. I think it was the great Spurgeon that said, prayer is when we come and we ring the, the bell before God. 
Uh, He likes to hear us pray. See, Paul could have just said, well, if that's the case, I don't need to pray for my fellow Jews. But listen to what he says in chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. His response to God's mercy was to pray for those who were not part of God's people. And so he challenges you, he challenges me today to pray. Pray for your work colleagues. Pray for your family who don't know the Lord. Pray for your friends. Pray that God would have mercy on them as he has had mercy on you. Sometimes we may think, as we look at people, we may say, Johnny, a person's not worth praying for. That person is never going to go to God, never going to come to God. Well, let me finish by encouraging you with a lovely little story about the famous John Newton, who was uh, Amazing Grace and all of that. Uh, he was a slave trader, and a person came and asked him. He said, um, "What about the likelihood of this person becoming a Christian? Is it really going to be possible?" And Newton replied that he never despaired of anyone being converted to Christianity because God was willing to save him. If God has had mercy on you and on me, then God can have mercy on anyone, folks. And we need to be praying that he will. Folks, God is faithful to his word. He chooses those that he saves. He saves purely out of his place of mercy. And when we start to grasp that, It should move us to a deeper level of worship. It should encourage us in our unity together to love one another, and it should drive us towards prayer. Let me pray as we finish, and then I'm going to hand over to to Chris. Father, we thank you for your mercy today. And even though we don't deserve it, your love so strong pours out on us and says, I love you. Your grace says, I love you even though So today, Lord, help each one of us, whether we are people who follow you or people who don't follow you, to grasp how wide and how deep and how far the love of God is in our lives. And may that drive us today to worship you deeply, to love one another in unity. And Lord, more than anything else, to think of those today that we long to see them come to you as their saviour. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks, Johnny. So, yeah, we've got a new one. Uh, new song's called His Mercy Is More. Um, it's quite an easy one to pick up. You can stay on your seats while we, while we learn this one. Um, so at the end of each verse, it comes around. These words come around. Our sins, they are many. His, his mercy is more. Um, we'll start with the chorus, and then we'll, we'll learn the verse after I've learned the chorus. So, Understand, singers, just you guys stay seated. Two, the 
of patience. What patience would wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. song what riches of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath a debt we could never afford our sins they are many but his mercy is more i've been thinking just in preparation for our our service today uh, and just how we respond to understanding uh, his mercy uh, and i was also thinking about patrick and patrick wrote uh, a, a prayer, also known as St. Patrick's Breastplate, um, which the words are going to come up on the screen now. And we're going to use them today to think about how God becomes the center of our universe, rather than us thinking that we're the center uh, from these words of Patrick. So I invite you to pray these together with me. I arise today. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me, from snares of devils, from temptation of vices, from everyone who shall wish me ill afar and near. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left. Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. May God today show you how to be an example of his love and his mercy uh, in all that you do. We're going to move now into a time of intercessory prayer as we pray for those situations at home and across our world and in our church where we know that God wants to hear the prayers of his servants. I'm going to invite, uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, invite Clive to come forward and as he comes forward, let me just pray the collect or the special prayer for today. 
most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on that cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. And we continue in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in your love and goodness, you have taught us to come close to you through prayer, prayer with penitence and faith. Ever-loving God, we thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. Thank you for your blessings over us. We give you thanks that you are able to bring hope through even the toughest of times, strengthening us for your purposes. We pray that you will continue to bless us with your great love and care. Thank you for your grace and mercy. We pray for our rector, Johnny, for Alison, Josh, and Nathan. We pray for David, Jacqueline, and their family, and for all the leaders in our church family. Be a constant presence in their lives. Let them always turn to you as a never failing source of strength, wisdom, and inspiration. Turn their disappointments, frustrations, and anxieties into joy. Bless them all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we give you thanks for the different communities that we are a part of, our families, our church family, our colleagues at work, our friends, both old and new. We thank you for all the joys and sorrows that these different relationships bring. This morning, we pray especially for all those in our surrounding community who do not have the love of family and friends around them, who struggle emotionally and financially. We give you our thanks for the Compassion Ministries and lift up before you Baby Basics, the Food Bank, Munch on Mondays, the School Uniform Scheme, Kintsugi Hope, WAVE and CAP Life Skills. Bless all those who volunteer and all those who benefit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we hold up to you all those in our parish who are sick, whether in body, mind, or spirit. May they know your presence with them and that you are their strength, their healing, and their salvation. But especially, Lord, let them know that you will be walking beside them and carrying them in their time of need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We cry out to you, Lord, and ask you to remember all those countries torn apart by war, natural disaster, and famine. We hold up before you the people of Israel and Palestine. Be alongside them as they seek a path towards peace and reconciliation. We ask especially for your mercy on the people of Nigeria. Please be with those Christians who have been abducted and the families of those who have been killed by Islamic terrorists. Father God, we pray that they can live in peace and harmony with each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the ministry of the Apostle Paul, the magnificent book of Romans, and the clear explanation of every aspect of our great salvation. Thank you that salvation is not gained through any work of ours. It doesn't depend on race, parentage, nationality, education, or anything else, but by faith in Christ Jesus, God's only Son, 
who died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin and rose from the grave so that we might have eternal life. Thank you for Paul's heart of compassion for all people. Help us all to, also to have compassion and give us opportunities to share the good news of the gospel with others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just let us uh, finish in blessing one another in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Chris. He's going to lead us in our final song. All right, let's stand, folks, for our final song, King of Kings.
standing, let me pray God's blessing over us. And today I'm going to use some very unusual words you might think. Uh, these, uh, this is a blessing that's actually used in the funeral service um, from the Church of Ireland, and yet it brings real comfort on a day when we think about the mercy and the grace of God. So may God give to you and to all those in your family whom you love his comfort and his peace, his light and his joy in this world and into the next. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and may he remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats for just a moment. Uh, I will quickly endeavor to run through the announcements. Uh, Please remember, if you can, to go down uh, and see all the the, uh, lovely pictures that the kids have done for St. Patrick's Day. Um, uh, Don't rush from the the school uh, playground if you've parked your car there. We've got plenty of time because there's tea and coffee and refreshments, an opportunity just to catch up with one another. On your way out of church, you will be bombarded. Um, This morning, I'm just asking if Paul... Uh, and someone else might be able to help him. Uh, uh, there's a couple of things I want to bombard you with. First of all, um, for Holy Week or for Holy Week and into Easter, um, there's a leaflet that will tell you all the things that we're doing. Um, after a bit of uh, jigging around, we're having services on the Monday evening of Holy Week, the Wednesday, and the Friday. On the Monday evening, we're going to do a very interactive thing happening down in the church hall, and that'll be specifically for uh, younger people and for, uh, for their families, and it's called Journey to the Cross. Uh, and it, it follows really, well, for anyone that, was, that remembers it from seven years ago, I did it seven years ago, and my thinking is people have forgotten it by now, but essentially what we do is we take people in through on that celebration in through the gates of Jerusalem, And then we follow the story of that final week of Jesus' life ending up at the cross. Um, So we have little invites uh, there. You might want to consider bringing someone along to that. Uh, It lasts about an hour, uh, and it's an opportunity just to tell uh, the Easter story in in a very new and very interactive way. The other thing that you're going to be handed out, uh, Max, thank you for prompting me, um, is, the, oh, uh, is the annual meeting. Um, uh, every year we have an annual meeting. It's an opportunity, as I say on this, to hear what's been happening in the church, to ask any questions, uh, and then to appoint uh, new roles. Because you come to the annual meeting doesn't mean that you suddenly get a job to do. Um, that is guaranteed. We're not going to force you, but it's an opportunity to hear what's been going on. I would really like every single one of you to be there. Uh, that requires sacrifice. If that means we have to put on a crash, uh, then I don't mind doing that. Um, I'm going to make a sacrifice that night, and I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, on April the 17th, Wednesday, April the 17th, at 7.30 p.m., Man City are playing Real Madrid in, uh, in the Etihad and I had already planned to book my tickets uh, to go across to see that match with Nathan. I even told Nathan that we were going, uh, which he's going to kill me for now, uh, but I won't be there because the vestry thing is actually far more important. I can't believe I'm saying that. It's far more important than uh, the City match. Uh, I'll get to other ones because they'll get through to the next round anyway. Um, so uh, please take a little leaflet. That'll give you the details just uh, off that. Um, in terms of everything else, everything else will be in. The one thing I would like to say is just that First Things conference um, that's coming up. Um, that's on the 27th of April. Uh, within the Church of Ireland, there are all kinds of changes taking place, unfortunately. Um, uh, and uh, uh, with that, uh, this conference is an opportunity for people who truly believe that the Word of God should be central to all we do, that that stays central. And there's going to be a day conference down in Moira. Uh, We've already bought tickets for it. uh, And it's on Saturday, I think, the 27th. Yeah, Saturday the 27th, and it includes lunch. The cost is £15. Please let me know if you would like uh, uh, a ticket for that. Final, final thing to say before we have coffee 
If you could help on that evening of the interactive, the interactive night in Easter, uh, in e Easter of Holy Week, then please let me know. It's not going to be that difficult, but it's going to be really difficult if we don't have people who could just help me on the night. So please consider coming in, uh, and saying to me. So hope you can enjoy the, the tea and coffee. If you have to dash out, I'll see you at the door and be blessed. So go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Cheers, Peter. Peter's up next.